It is now my great pleasure to introduce our commencement speaker, Jennifer Moore. Jennifer is an award-winning journalist and the news director and content coordinator for KSMU Radio, the NPR station serving the Ozarks. She studied Arabic and history at the American University in Cairo and graduated from the University of Missouri School of Journalism before spending five years in the Persian Gulf. Why there, she contributed to the CNN International, NPR, and the largest daily English newspaper in the region, the Gulf News. As a freelance journalist reporting on human rights abuses of domestic workers and the humanitarian toll of the Second Iraq War. After returning to the United States in 2007, she worked as a reporter, anchor, and assignment editor for KSMU Radio in Springfield. She has received the Excellence in Legal Journalism Award from the Missouri Bar, a National Edward R. Murrow Award for coverage of the Joplin tornado, and the 2013 Toner Prize for Excellence in Political Reporting. Today, she works with a team of, at Ozarks Public Broadcasting to make sure the Ozarks has an in-depth news about our region, Washington, D.C., and the world. She also reports as a contributor for NPR on national stories from the Ozarks. One of five siblings, Jennifer grew up on a farm outside West Plains, Missouri. Her master's degree from Missouri State University blended Middle Eastern politics and journalism, and she taught international reporting and storytelling as MSU's journalist in residence. She now lives in Springfield in her spare time. She enjoys exploring new places, fly fishing, yes, fly fishing, and spending time with her family. Please help, Rick. Please help me welcome Jennifer Moore to the podium. Good morning. Good morning, graduates, family and friends, President Smart, MSU Board of Governors, and faculty and staff. When I first mentioned to my friends that I was invited to speak this morning, they, give, they gave two points of advice. Number one, keep it short. And number two, no one really remembers the commencement speaker anyway. You'll be fine. So, no pressure, right? I want to tell you briefly about two remarkable women and how they relate to the concept of love. One was a little Latvian girl named Ilga, born in the 1930s, just as Germany was encroaching across Europe. At age 10, Ilga and her parents were arrested by German troops, and they were forced onto a one-way train car full of strangers. When I interviewed Ilga years ago, she could still vividly remember arriving at the camp, surrounded by barbed wire, where she saw Jewish and disabled prisoners who looked half-starved, begging Ilga and her parents for food. And even though she was a kid, Ilga was forced to do hard labor, mixing cement with the adults that would be used for roadblocks for the German army. But there came a day when the Nazi guards suddenly packed their bags and abandoned the camp. And Ilga and her family just started walking west. They walked hundreds of miles to a refugee camp. And the journey they walked by foot was the same distance from Springfield to Chicago. Eventually, they sailed to the United States as refugees. Many of you know her in this community as Ilga Weiss. And she's my guest this morning, sitting up there with my family. She devoted her life to educating others about pluralism and democracy and loving others, despite of, or perhaps even because of, their differences. I believe that kind of acceptance is a form of love, and we need a lot more of it today. And I think sometimes when we hear that term, love, we envision flowers or peace signs. And in terms of domestic and foreign policy that you graduates, many of you have learned about, even submissiveness or weakness. But I believe love is brave and bold. It holds others to account, and it relates to justice and transparency. Almost the entire five years I lived in the Persian Gulf, I knew an inspiring American woman named Mari. So Mari was from Tulsa, where her mom had taught the humanities. Mari's Gulf Arabic skills were super impressive, and whenever we went shopping together in the outdoor souk, she bargained so well that I ended up feeling sorry for the shopkeepers even after they had made a sale. When I was homesick, 
Mari would invite me over to her, her place for mashed potatoes and meatloaf. But behind closed doors, Mari's personal situation was dire. She had endured some of the darkest things a woman can experience. And there came a day when she just couldn't live like that anymore. Now, many of you who have studied international relations know that women, even American women living in the Persian Gulf, are often under the so-called guardianship laws. And these are laws ubiquitous across the Persian Gulf that force almost all women to relinquish their rights to travel freely, go to college, get married or divorced, or start a business without the permission of a male guardian. These laws apply to old and young women alike, and the guardian is usually a husband or a father or son. And remarkably, there was another American woman from the Midwest in a very similar situation to Mari's. And as their circumstances deteriorated, the two kept in touch. They both made a decision to leave and seek a more humane life for themselves and their children. But in the end, only one of those two American women was able to watch their children grow up in the United States with the rights afforded to us here. And that person was me. My passport and access to money had been taken from me by someone I had once trusted. I fled to the embassy in Doha for help, but I was told that as long as I was in a foreign land, foreign law applied to me, including the guardianship laws. After several terrifying weeks, I found a brief window to escape back to the United States. My family's here today, and they remember when I secretly sent this email to them in West Plains. I will be coming with virtually no money and few clothes. Start praying. I'm not afraid, but I am nervous. This is going to take a lot of courage. I read somewhere that on the other side of every fear is a freedom. What a great quote. On the transatlantic plane ride to the US, I fainted once and threw up twice purely from the stress. Now, my daughter, who is at this very hour taking a history exam in a Springfield High School, has grown up oblivious to this part of our journey. She has thrived in an orchestra, on a swim team. She debates about Jefferson versus Adams, and she has no limits on her dreams. But while Mari made it back to the US, her daughter, the same age as mine, is still in the Middle East or North Africa, we're not even sure where, most likely in Morocco, because of the guardianship laws. Now, I've never spoken publicly about this, and I don't plan to ever again, but I'm telling you this because I am looking out over a sea of graduates who are now the policy makers, the diplomats, the political scientists. You are now going on to become the Department of Defense staff and the nurses who look out for signs of human trafficking and abuse. And I am so hopeful that you all are going to take us to a better place, a place built on love and respect and accountability. I hope you get out there and you have so much fun and that you experience great reward and that you see every day for its potential. I hope you realize the power of education and the degrees that you're taking from this impressive place. If I am so lucky to live to the average life expectancy age of American women, then that means I'm almost halfway through my journey here. But I want to live to see the end of repressive laws that hold women, girls, and the vulnerable back. And I promise it really is okay if you don't remember my name in six months or a year from now, but I would like you to remember this. The next time you read about the guardianship laws in the Persian Gulf or another action or policy that moves us away from love, please know that your voice matters. I have seen one phone call to a newsroom make a difference. I've seen one constituent cause an elected official to see things in a different light. I want to thank Missouri State University for giving me extraordinary opportunities. And I want to thank my family and my best friend, Sam, for being here today.
Congratulations, graduates, and good luck.